Welcome. I am Alexis Flowers, Director of Programs here at the Network of Enlightened Women. New educates, equips, and empowers young women to be principal leaders for a free society. Today, I am joined by Sarah Partial Perry of the Perry of the Heritage Foundation for a discussion on the recent on recent Supreme Court decisions, including last week's historic decision to overturn Roe versus Wade. Sarah is a senior legal, legal fellow for the Edwin Meese III Center for Legal and Judicial Studies, part of the Institute for Constitutional Government at Heritage. Her work centers on civil rights and the proper role of the courts. She previously served as the senior counsel to the Assistant Secretary for Civil Rights at the U.S. Department of Education, where she focused on policy reform, technical guidance, and the Office for Civil Rights annual report to Congress. Prior to that, she spent six years at the Family Research Council, where she was a senior fellow for education reform. Thank you for being with us today, Sarah. Thanks for having me. Yes. Okay, so lots of exciting things happening <laughs> in recent weeks. Why don't you take it away? Tell us a little bit about these decisions. Sure. So within the past few weeks, the Supreme Court has held that the Constitution does not, after 50 years of finding the opposite, confer a right to abortion. Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey are overruled, and the authority to regulate abortion is returned to the people and their elected representatives. So my discussion today could not be more perfectly timed. I'm not going to discuss just the policy of abortion, but rather I'm going to address how the court reached its decision and under what method of legal interpretation because how should we interpret the laws of our nation? The calculus ought to be simple, we think. After all, laws consists of words and words have meaning. They indicate what the law is, simple, right? But in both constitutional and statutory law, there's a worrying trend of straying from principles that have safeguarded the laws of our nation for more than two centuries. The principles that work, those that provide a framework outside the seeping influence of political motivation, ulterior motive or subjectivity matter because they're essential to our liberties. And those principles of interpretation are originalism and textualism. Now, textualism and originalism are two names for largely the same methodology. They are sort of kissing cousins. Textualism developed as a subset of originalism and is a type of originalism. But today it's most often used in the statutory context, those concerning the laws of Congress. Originalism came first and it arose in methods of constitutional interpretation. Both guard against consequentialism or purposivism big words, but what they mean is that judges under these theories reach whatever ruling is necessary to achieve the best social consequences or the outcome that they want to see. Originalism doesn't claim to rewrite the Constitution with grand pronouncements or faddish social theories. It simply calls for an understanding of the Constitution based on what the Constitution says. Like originalism, Textualism is the theory that we should interpret texts, not just statutes, but the Constitution as well, based on the text's ordinary meaning, giving consideration to what the words and phrases in the text meant when that provision was adopted into law. Originalism's Originalism's revival in the 1980s was a reaction to the theory of something called living constitutionalism. Now that called for judges to interpret the constitution not according to its language, but according to evolving social standards. In other words, judges were asked not to focus on what the constitution says, but what it ought to read if it were written today. When the Supreme Court engaged in living constitutionalism, the justices pretty much ignored its words. But by the time we reached the 60s, our living constitution had become sort of a mutating virus that was injected with the political philosophy and DNA of interpreting jurists. By using living constitutionalism to rewrite laws in their own image, conservative scholars accused the justices of what was then 
the Warren Court of usurping the powers of the legislative branch. In other words, making law as opposed to interpreting it. So what have two of the staunch conservatives currently on the Supreme Court said about originalism and textualism? Well, we'll start with Justice Neil Gorsuch. In his book, A Republic If You Can Keep It, Justice Gorsuch discussed textualism and noted that many of the same clues that suggest judges should use originalism in the interpretation of the Constitution also suggested using it in the interpretation of statutes. And you see there how the two theories are related. He wrote, any theory of interpretation seeking to comply with the Constitution and the values it serves must respect the divide between making law and interpreting it, honoring the grueling legislative process, not seeking to invent shortcuts and protecting the people from political pressures when it comes to the application of the laws in their cases and controversies. Textualism does all this. When interpreting statutes, it tasks judges with discerning only what an ordinary English speaker familiar with the law's usages would have understood the term to mean at the time of its enactment. In the end, textualism is about ensuring that our written law is our actual law. Supreme Court Justice Amy Coney Barrett explained a year later the relationship between originalism and textualism. She too is an adherent to these philosophies. She wrote, originalists like textualists care about what people understood words to mean at the time that the law was enacted because those people had the authority to make the law. They did so through a legitimate process, which included writing down and fixing the law. So each textual provision must necessarily bear the meaning attributed to it at the time of its adoption. And as with statutes, the law can mean no more or less than communicated by the language in which it is written. Just as when a precise statute seems over or under inclusive in relation to its ultimate aim, a textualist keeps closely to the rules embedded in the enacted text rather than adjusting the text to make it more consistent with a purpose or a desired aim. An originalist also submits to the precise compromise reflected in the text of the Constitution. So that is how judges approach legal text and the constitution is no exception. So if you're hearing a common theme, it is what the text meant at the time of its enactment by ordinary English speakers who were writing the law. That will be important in the Dobbs decision. Both textualism and originalism counter a reading of the law that is malleable, a moving target, or is infused into the document the reader's own desired meaning. Failing to follow either principle leads to bad case law and even worse public outcomes. And nothing got us to a bad public outcome faster than Roe versus Wade. Roe versus Wade is the nation's most controversial Supreme Court decision. It failed to follow originalist or textualist decisions. And in fact, not only didn't use those principles, it was a consequentialist ruling, meaning that Justice Blackmun in writing for the seven man majority on the Roe Court decided that he would find an outcome that society deserved, not what the Constitution actually said. It has now been sent to history's dust heap in the Dobbs versus Jackson Whole Women's Health case. So if perhaps you're wondering why constitutional or statutory interpretation, originalism and textualism need some fangirls, now you know why. Just a few short days ago, the court in Dobbs versus Jackson held this. The constitution does not confer a right to abortion. Roe and Casey are overruled and the authority to regulate abortion is returned to the people and their elected representatives. 
1973 in Roe, Justice Blackmun argued that there was a constitutional right to abortion in the Constitution's emanations and penumbras, somewhere in the Ninth Amendment from which a right to privacy was developed and then applied to the states through the 14th Amendment. But for five decades, even liberal constitutional scholars could not defend its reading of the Constitution. Some even saying it was not only not a constitutional decision, but gave no attempt to be. Even today, the liberal justices, Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan, in their dissent, could not defend Roe as a legitimate constitutional exercise, instead relying on things like the reliance interests and societal needs for abortion. The majority opinion in Dobbs versus Jackson Hole Women's Health employs originalism perfectly to objectively answer the question of whether it is accurate to say that the Constitution creates or protects a right to abortion and whether it is appropriate to send Roe to history's dust heap. Justice Alito began his analysis by saying constitutional analysis must begin with the language of the instrument, which offers a fixed standard for ascertaining what our founding document means. The constitution makes no express reference to a right to obtain an abortion. And he later added, we must ask what the 14th amendment means by the term liberty. Remember, the due process clause of the 14th amendment says that no citizen shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Alito continued, when we engage in that inquiry in the present case, it is clear that the answer is that the 14th Amendment does not protect the right to abortion. Unlike Roe, a consequentialist decision where the justices deemed the best social outcome post women's liberation movement was to divine a right in the constitution to abortion, Dobbs versus Jackson is anchored by text, history, and the structure of the Constitution. Alito writes that Roe versus Wade was egregiously wrong from the start. It is time to heed the Constitution and return the issue of abortion to the people's representatives. The Constitution now returns to a value neutral stance on abortion, and the states will be the primary authority on legislating for themselves on the issue of abortion, something they have always been doing since Roe versus Wade to varying degrees of success. Our nation works best if its constitution is treated as a document with stable principles, meaning, and guidelines. When jurists insert their moral and philosophical predilections into the meaning of the Constitution, we can and have ended up with horrible Supreme Court decisions, including Korematsu versus United States, which permitted the internment of Japanese citizens in World War II, Buck versus Bell, allowing the forced sterilization of women, Plessy versus Ferguson condoning Jim Crow laws and the establishment of separate but equal based on race, and Dred Scott versus Sanford, which allowed for the return of fugitive slaves after announcing no African American could be a citizen. These, thankfully, have all been overturned by originalist readings of the Constitution. In a few days ago, the Supreme Court issued an opinion in New York Rifle and Pistol Association v. Bruin, also a constitutional case, this time concerning a Second Amendment right to bear arms. Justice Thomas wrote for the majority and said, although its meaning is fixed according to the understandings of who ratified it, the Constitution can and must apply to circumstances beyond those the founders specifically anticipated. The importance of textualism and originalism today 
of following the letter of the law understood by its drafters and enactors and not infusing it with personal meaning or political preference is plain for everyone to see. Thank you. <laughs> well, that was, there's a lot to unpack there, um, but I really appreciate the context and the history lesson true, uh, truly of what, what has happened in the last few weeks and the last few decades. Um, kind of just let's look at last week and, and the decision with Roe v. Wade. Why did the Supreme Court decide to review this decision now? I think it is because they had the right court composition, but more importantly, had the right precise question granted to them. And that precise question was whether or not all pre-viability restrictions on abortion were unconstitutional. Viability was the standard that was established in Roe versus Wade. And in that particular opinion, the justices said a state could regulate after viability. In other words, after a fetus could survive outside the room, but not before. Then in Planned Parenthood versus Casey, they kept viability in place in 1992, but added an additional characteristic. It could not be an undue burden on a woman's right to abortion. The actual case that came before the court, Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health, concerned Mississippi's Gestational Age Act. And that particular act restricted abortions after 15 weeks. Now, 15 weeks is before viability, but it's when we know a fetus can feel pain, when physiological developments have taken place, all neurological function and circuitry is in place. So the state has an interest in protecting life at 15 weeks. Could they get the Supreme Court to tackle viability head on? And the answer, obviously, now we know is yes. They realize that after so many years, nearly 50 years of taking piecemeal restrictions on abortion, upholding some, striking down others, replacing viability with undue burden, it was too many cuts at a longstanding, poorly written opinion, and it was time to send it back to the states where it belonged. Right. So as of last week, the decision is now back to the states. What were the immediate implications? Like what changed on Friday, that day? Well, immediately, a lot of states had previously enacted what are called trigger laws. And those laws were drafted in such a way as to be immediately affected uh, upon the overruling of Roe versus Wade. Um, prior to the decision, about 26 states have already restricted abortion. Um, about the other half have expanded abortion access. So now the battle is going to take place predominantly in the state houses. We have some states like California, New York, Washington, DC, the Northeast, that are all going to have incredibly permissive abortion regimes. In fact, Washington, D.C., where the Heritage Foundation is located, has virtually no restrictions whatsoever on abortion. So we know late-term abortions take place here. Now, it's going to look a bit like a patchwork. Some states will restrict to such an extent that women who want an abortion need to travel over state lines to get one. We also anticipate that the use of medication abortions will increase. Just a few days ago, Secretary Becerra, the Secretary for Health and Human Services, indicated that they were investigating two options, increase of access to abortifacients through the FDA, and also through the use of federal land or federal enclaves to build abortion clinics and provide abortion services. These are two very complicated legal questions on which uh, we, and specifically by that I mean me, are leading the research efforts. But what we're trying to do is make sure that every level of government has every opportunity to protect life to the extent that the Constitution allows. Under the 10th Amendment, the 10th Amendment allows states to specifically legislate on issues concerning health, safety, welfare, and medicine. Medicine, health, obviously fall under that rubric for, among other things, abortion, vaccination, public health, medical licensing. So it's precisely within the state's power 
to legislate on abortion. So what I tell most people to whom I've spoken with on this issue is to use your feet in the ballot box to go vote your values. This is an opportunity to be as active and engaged in American representative government as you have ever been. Because now the issue of abortion will essentially come home to roost. It will impact you where you are living, where you are going to school, where you settle professionally, where you want to raise a family. So it is an encouragement, not only that this is an originalist perspective and a good state's rights case, but also because it's a good case for democracy. We don't want courts in the business of making law. And what Justice Alito essentially said in the opinion was that, listen, the 1973 court was making law. That's the job for the legislatures. And that's not the job for the Supreme Court. That in and of itself is a win for representative democracy. And that actually ties perfectly in with my next question, which is about Congress. Could Congress decide to act on this issue? That's a great question. So Congress has certain enumerated powers in the Constitution. And if I'm saying the word Constitution a lot, it's because that is the principal issue involved in the Roe and the Dobbs discussion on abortion. What does the Constitution allow at the federal level and at the state level? Constitutionally, the federal government only has certain enumerated powers. For example, um, powers under the property clause. So when you hear Xavier Becerra, Secretary of Health and Human Services, say we are investigating federal enclaves or federal land, it is because certain land options that are already owned by the federal government may present an opportunity to provide abortion access. That will naturally be challenged, particularly by the pro-life legislators in the House and Senate. And my guess is that particularly so after November midterms. So they do have some power under the federal property clause in the constitution. They also have property under the spending clause, the ability of the federal government to tax and spend. In that context, if they can make a connection to interstate commerce, which for example, we've been successful in advancing on the Hyde Amendment, which prohibits the expenditure of anyone's tax dollars in enhancement or provision of abortion services, they would try to argue exactly the opposite. Try to make a connection to money, services, or goods that transfer across state lines, and any kind of financial interest to be able to create a right to abortion at the federal level. That is a weaker right. I see that as less of an opportunity for them constitutionally. They would have to throw in language at the end of a bill providing an abortion right to the extent that it affects or impacts interstate commerce. And the Supreme Court is very likely to look at that and say, it's not really an interstate commerce bill. You're just throwing that in there so that you get some kind of a federal legislative hook. That will distinctly be challenged by not only federal pro-life legislators, but those who are in the states as well as exceeding the authority that Congress actually has in the constitution. Okay, thank you. Um, I've also been seeing things, some questions we've been getting from a lot of our students. They've been seeing a lot of posts about what does this mean? What does this not mean? Especially as it pertains to miscarriages or ectopic pregnancies. Can you talk a little bit about that? Is there, what does this ruling mean for those things? So it will not have, depending on the state that you're in, um, and we've been tracking the state bills very closely, there will be no impact on ectopic pregnancies or on miscarriages. Miscarriages obviously are spontaneous. They are mistakes that just happen. And I speak as someone who has had a miscarriage in between child two and three. These are not criminal offenses. They won't be penalized. Medicine will continue the same way it has, providing the services that are needed for healing and recovery after miscarriage, whether that's a DNC, 
to remove a, um, an unborn child that's died in the womb, whatever it is. So it won't have any impact on miscarriages whatsoever. And nearly all of the state laws that I have reviewed all indicate that there is a life of the mother exception. Ectopic pregnancy presents a threat to the mother. So in just about every state in the nation, there is for those pro-life laws, an exception for the health of the mother. Ectopic pregnancies in many cases expire on their own, but for those that don't, we have been advising regularly that a life of the mother clause is included in all of the bills in each of these states that are protecting life. Thank you, yes. Um, and so along with that, there is a lot of misinformation, a lot of things flying very quickly uh, on the internet as, 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 as with a lot of these decisions. Um, where would you suggest that the women in our network go to find accurate, timely updates on this information? Well, we work with a number of organizations. First of all, I'm going to send you to heritage.org because I have to shamelessly promote my own uh, think tank and our Absolutely. DeVos Center uh, for Life, for uh, Liberty and um, Family is all very closely tracking this. We are developing legal answers. My Mies legal group is developing legal answers on questions like abortifacient access, whether or not states can restrict it, uh, whether or not federal enclaves can be used. These are sort of some of the developing legal theories. And if you listen to what's being said by the Biden administration closely, you'll see that they haven't committed one way or another. They've just indicated these are avenues that they also are going to be researching. We're gonna have a lot of discussions in the coming days on states' rights. But heritage.org, all you have to do is search abortion in the um, search bar. You'll come up with a ton of resources that we've developed. We now have a pro-life map of where each state in the nation is on abortion expansion or abortion restriction where life is most protected, in which states, where it's least protected, pending legislation. And I also commend to you all uh, the SBA list as well. And they too have been running a pro-life map so that you can track what the actual law is in your particular state. Wonderful, thank you. I know that'll be helpful um, as things continue to develop in the coming days and weeks. Um, so I, we could continue talking about this for a long time and maybe we will have you back soon to talk about some of the other cases and things that have been happening this month. It's been a busy month for the Supreme Court. We definitely um, have. And we have two more yet to go. So yes, yes, we're not even done. So <laughs> thank you so much, Sarah, for taking the time to be with us today. This was incredibly informative. Um, and thank you to everyone tuning in to watch this conversation about a very timely issue for our country. So thank you so much. Thanks, Alexis.